Chartism was a 19th century movement. Chartists campaigned for better political rights for working men in order that their working and living conditions could be improved. They based their campaign around a People's Charter published in 1838 by William Lovett. Their charter included six points. The right to a secret ballot, that all men over 21 be given the right to vote, payment for people standing as MPs, equal constituencies, no property qualification for MPs, and an annual parliament. Chartists organized their campaign around a petition to parliament, demanding that the six points be met. 1.25 million people signed, asking for the demands of the People's Charter to be met. When presented to Parliament in 1839, it was immediately rejected. On the 4th of November 1839, thousands of men marched from the valleys to the Westgate Hotel in Newport. They demanded the release of Chartists who had been imprisoned. The authorities were terrified of revolution. Through a network of informers and spies, they knew of the Chartist plans. Soldiers from the 45th Regiment of Foot took up position in the hotel. No one knows who fired the first shot, but 22 Chartists were killed and many more injured. Ten of the Chartist bodies were buried under cover of darkness in unmarked graves in St. Willis Graveyard. All the leaders and many others involved in the march were rounded up and arrested. Rewards of £100 were offered for some of the main leaders, including John Frost and Zephaniah Williams. In the days following the march, 253 people gave testimony to the examining magistrates at the Westgate Inn in Newport. These are some of their words. John Davis Collier Bliner. About four months ago I joined a Chartist Lodge which was held at Zephaniah Williams Public House at Colebrookville. I paid three different times and I received a card. I have since thrown it away and the number on it was 451. The Friday before the riots, Zephaniah Williams told him that they ought to unite and take anything they could catch, guns, pikes or a staff, and arm themselves as well as they could and that no harm would come to them from being armed. There would be no bloodshed. Only those that stopped away would be the cause of bloodshed. Old John Williams, a beer housekeeper, used also to speak to the same effect. A week before the riot, Williams told me that there would be a meeting at Zephaniah's house every night that week, and that I might come if I had in mind. I only went on the Friday evening. Zephaniah spoke about uniting as before, and told me to come there on the Sunday morning. I went to the house about 11 o'clock Sunday morning. I stayed about two hours. The room was full. Zephaniah told us that there would be a larger meeting on the mountain. He hoped that every one of us would come. At two o'clock I went to Zephaniah's house again with many others. He told us to be on the mountain between six and seven of that evening and to bring what we could to defend ourselves. No harm would come to us. I went to the mountain and met several hundreds of the most armed Guns, pikes, staffs. I had a gun. I do not know whether it was loaded or not. I did not load it, and Zephaniah told us where we were to go to Newport. And we went down the tram road. We did not go into any order until we got to Tadiga Park. We did not stop until we came to a public house this side of Risca. At the place, the tram road crosses the turnpike road, a steep part. I saw Zephaniah there. He was walking backwards and forwards. I did not see him afterwards. I went to a small beer house by the side of the tram road to dry myself. I ate some bread and cheese and drank two pints of beer. I waited until daylight and the gang came down. We went to Tadiga Park. I was blind but told to go forward because I had a gun. Several told me, but I do not know who in particular. We already picked up the Waterloo. There was a man dressed in a blanket, long smock was in front and happened to take command. He said, come on, rank it yourselves tidy. I never saw him before, and he led us down Stowell to the Westgate Inn. I followed him just to the area of the Westgate, 
when I jumped down I heard firing and saw people running. I threw away my gun and ran to I have heard Jones the watchmaker speak at Zephaniah's house to the same effect as Zephaniah and Old Williams. Margaret Davis, wife of Thomas Davis, labourer Newport. On the morning of the 4th of November last, about 9 o'clock, I went from my house in Friars Fields to Commercial Street and stood opposite Mr Williams, the druggist, for the purpose of ascertaining the truth of a report that the charters were come to Newport and to look for my children who had left my house for the purpose of going to school. Whilst I was standing there, I saw a great number of men come down Charles Street and turn the corner at the bottom. They went up Commercial Street towards the West Gate. Some were armed with guns, some with pikes, and others had sticks. I said to them as they passed, Take God in your hearts and turn back. They went on. I followed them on the pavement. They were in the road. I went as far as Mr Lloyd's shop opposite the West Gate. I don't know how many I saw come down Charles Street. As near as I can say, one hundred. While standing at Lloyd's shop, I saw another body of men come down Stowe Hill, also armed. They joined the party that came up Commercial Street. The both parties turned and faced the West Gate. While I was looking for my children, I heard the windows of the West Gate dashed in. I also heard firing. I was so much alarmed on account of my children that I did not look at the breaking of the windows, nor did I see the men fire. I did not see any men go up Charles Street. Charles Young, Witness Special Constable. I remember the 4th of November last. It was a great riot that day. I saw the mob about half past nine in the morning at the station house on Stowe Hill, near the opposite Charles Street. I saw the charters coming down Stowe Hill. I dare say I saw nearly 400. I could see up Stow Hill as far as the church and I could see down Stow Hill as far as the Westgate Inn. The whole space was filled by the mob, some of them armed with guns, others with bludgeons and other offensive weapons. I saw the prisoner, Richard Rock, that day whilst the mob was going down the hill. I saw him coming up the pavement on the left-hand side of Charles Street. He was walking fast. He came to the mob. He went to the mob and I lost sight of him. The mob was going down towards the Westgate Inn. This was before the Westgate Inn was attacked. I heard firing very soon after I lost sight of the prisoner in the crowd. I did not see anything in the prisoner's hand. Basil Gray, Lieutenant in the 45th Regiment of Foot, doing duty at Newport. I received orders on Monday morning last a little after 8 o'clock to proceed to the Westgate Hotel and to put myself under the order of the Mayor. I repaired there immediately with 30 men. I formed in front of the building. The Mayor then ordered me to enter the courtyard, the gate of which was closed after me. He then took me to a building on the right of the hotel. The room I occupied was part of this house, and he asked me if it suited my purposes. It did so and I immediately proceeded to get it cleared of furniture and various other articles with which it was crowded. The room was foul with smoke, as it had been all full of constables all night. I then marched my men in. The mayor gave me orders to conceal my men as much as possible and to avoid irritating the mob, which was approaching to effect, which I closed the windows, shutters of the room, and latched them. I had time to give my men a few necessary instructions when I heard cheering, and the mayor told me they were approaching. They formed in front of the house. I saw a few of their spearheads over the half shutters, and they immediately let fly a volley of small arms. This demolished the window and brought down all the glass. I immediately gave word to load. I did, do, I did not do this before, as I hoped the matter would have not turned so seriously. While my men were loading, which took a very short time, the crowd effected an entrance into the building by rushing into the hall, and the back entrance into a passage which communicated with the door of our room. As soon as we were loaded, I stepped forwards to unlatch one of the window shutters. The mayor handsomely opened another. This unmasked us, and a quantity of small arms were discharged, at which the mayor was twice wounded, 
and a sergeant by my side was wounded in the head. I saw him covered with blood and hear them both say they were hit. The mayor only in a whisper which could not have been heard by my men and went sit down. The sergeant also mentioned it to me very quietly. Our men soon got to work. This continued for ten minutes when I saw our shots were becoming thin for want of objects. Their shots were not repeated after our soldiers commenced firing. I then went into the passage with a few of my men to see how things were looking. I saw there was no more attack. When I returned to the room, I ordered them to cease firing from the bow window, which I obeyed immediately. I then made preparation to strengthen my position in case of a second attack. While so employed, I entered a side room leading from the passage and saw the two prisoners in a corner. I ordered them to follow me and gave them over to my men as prisoners. I saw nothing in their hands, but upon examining their persons, a quantity of ball ammunition was found on the prisoner Benfield. I was putting a dead body out of the way, and I saw the two prisoners concealing themselves in the room, which was dark, having its shutters closed. They had evidently gone into the room out of the passage for the purpose of avoiding the firing of my men. I saw them eating bread and cheese given them by my men. On seeing that there was another attack imminent, I immediately had all the dead bodies in the house removed and placed them in the courtyard and some in the passage leading to the kitchen. When things became quiet, I collected some more dead bodies from outside the house and placed them with the other dead bodies. There were in whole nine dead bodies in the house. When I was fired upon, I did not want any instruction to return it. The mayor was by my side. After the uprising, 50 men were charged with high treason and many others with lesser charges. A special commission was set up and 29 prisoners were sent to Monmouth Jail. Eventually, the grand jury decided to charge 14 of these prisoners with high treason. The last mass treason trial to take place in mainland Britain began on the 31st of December 1839. It ended with the sentencing of the prisoners on 16th of January, 1840. The presiding judge at the trial, Lord Chief Justice Sir Nicholas Tyndall, delivered the verdict. You stand at the bar of this court to receive the last sentence of the law for the commission of a crime which, beyond all others, is the most pernicious in example and the most injurious in its consequences to the peace and happiness of human society. Crime of high treason against your sovereign. And now nothing more remains than the duty imposed upon the court. To all of us a most painful duty to declare the last sentence of the law, which is that you, John Frost, and you, Zephaniah Williams, and you, William Jones, be taken hence to the place from whence you came, and be then drawn on a hurdle to the place of execution, and that each of you be there hanged by the neck until you be dead, and that afterwards the head of each of you shall be severed from his body, and the body of each divided into four quarters shall be disposed of as Her Majesty shall think fit. And may Almighty God have mercy upon your souls. There was an outcry at the harshness of this sentence, and on the 31st of January, the Home Secretary reduced the sentence to transportation for life. The three men were taken to Tasmania, where they arrived at the end of June. They were eventually pardoned in 1854. Five of the six points of the Charter have now come into effect. We don't have annual elections, but we have secret ballots. Our MPs are paid and are not required to own property. Constituencies have also been made more equal. All men and women over 18 have the right to vote. <laughs>